What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of the Sheehan Show here on Sherdog.com. My name is Sean Sheehan, and today I am looking ahead to July and the best five fights that, uh, in my opinion, are happening in that month. Now, there are uh, a lot of good fights actually happening in July and a lot of good cards as well. We have two UFC pay-per-views. There's uh, the PFL return to Europe. There's a big one championship card as well. And as always, Bellator uh, have uh, have something for us, and it's, it's pretty good as well. And I've picked, funnily enough, one fight from each of those cards. Now, if they're all five fights from one card, I would do that. But that's just the way I uh, uh, it happened to happen here. And I think it, it kind of happens that way most months, if I'm being honest, because uh, there is a good spread and a good spread of what you're looking forward to uh, as well, I suppose. And um, we uh, we certainly have that. And I just think it's interesting as well, just on, on that point, before I get into the fights. Like, I, I think... Over the last while, with the whole Francis Ngannou situation going to PFL, all this talk of Bellator and uh, and PFL merging and all of that malarkey, and then with one championship, you know, doing good stuff as well, as well as the UFC, I think it's become a very interesting thing, because I hear a lot of people talking about, like, oh, PFL, who's going to fight Francis and stuff, and, uh, you know, who, who'd be the big fights between Bellator and PFL, and you can... You could tell, like, people don't watch them. <laughs> you know, you really can, or they don't analyze them, or they don't understand, you know, who are the good fighters from each uh, each organization. And, like, I think that's a bit baffling. Like, it, it's it's very tough to concentrate on every organization. You know, it's tough, even the, the likes of KSW and Octagon. I do my best to try to catch up with them, but, like, even for me, who tries to catch up and everything, it's very, very tough to do it. But you would think with Bellator and PFL, we would kind of know, like... If you don't know who Sadabu C is at this stage, you know, it's promotional malpractice, you know, <laughs> or a journalistic, MMA journalistic malpractice, or, you know, if you don't know who Ante Delia is, even though he didn't manage to, to qualify because the first fight uh, went the way, or if you don't know who Fahina Fahey is, like, you should know who these guys are uh, at this stage, but it's not that you should know who they are, like, the promotions should have told us who they are. Now, and I wonder... Well, that actually, like, hold them back if the merger does happen, right? That a lot of people don't know. But, like, I feel like people not knowing could almost lead to some really fun stuff. Because, like, you could have someone, like, let's say, an Amosov, right? And then everyone kind of knows how good he is. And then he fights Sadabu C. And, like, you know, who would win that fight? You know, probably, I think Amosov would be a big favorite. But Sadabu C is not an easy fight for him at all. Or, you know, whoever it might be, like Ryan Bader against uh, an Antetidia or whatever fight it might be. There are so many fights out there that could be really cool, but I feel like <laughs> the level of analysis of them is not there. Now, luckily enough, you someone like me who covers the UFC and PFL and Bellator every single show, so it's a little bit, uh, I have a li- maybe a little bit of an advantage, luckily, thanks, <laughs> thanks to my, uh, my short dog work, but... um. Yeah, I think it's it's very interesting because, and I, I, that's actually not a criticism there. It might, might sound like it is, but there's just so much stuff to keep on top of. Um, it's really hard. It is really, really, really hard. And when I go through these, and, and the reason I bring it into this uh, podcast is when I go through my like top five fights for a month, last week uh, or last month, I picked eight fights. And, you know, I, I kind of, I did that because I, I I really liked a lot. And these are my personal favorite top five as well. Maybe not, they're not the best or maybe someone else would like them. You could definitely argue there are better fighters and better fights than a couple of these. No, no problem with that. These are my favorite five fights. But I, I think... You know, to not be looking forward to a Sadabu C fighter, to be not looking forward to whoever uh, I, I love, uh, Rio Shikudo in PFL, to not be looking forward to or uh, uh, a Danny Sabatillo fight or something like that. It's uh, you know, it's not it's not what MMA always was, you know. And we always give out as MMA journalists or media members and fans as well about I ah, MMA is not what I used to be. But like MMA fans used to want to love everything as well, and we're not. And don't get me wrong. I'm not that anymore either. <laughs> so, so I'm not, I'm not criticizing anyone. That's just the fact of the matter, I think. But anyway, that's what this show is about. So maybe we can throw out a few interesting matchups, throw out a few uh, interesting fights coming up. Maybe you don't realize they're coming up now. A few of these you absolutely do realize are coming up. But there are at least three of them, I think, out of these five, that I'm, I would say not everyone would 100% know that's coming up or maybe not 100% know the two lads or maybe not 100% know uh, how good this fight would be in my opinion so that's why we're here first one is not that at all uh number one of my five fights for the month is 
uh, a big one. Everyone knows it's coming up, and it's Alexander Volkanovsky versus Yair Rodriguez. Now, this is interesting, right? Because it, it, it's funny in, in a couple of different ways. Because if you think about the last, how, how long is it now? Maybe six weeks, two months. I watched the build up to the Arnold Allen um, fight against Max Holloway and spoke about it an awful lot. And my thinking, my thought coming up to that whole fight was like, why are they making this fight? Arnold Allen should be fighting for the title. Before Rodriguez fought, who, who did he fight? Emmett, wasn't it? My talk was like, why is this fight even happening? Aaron Lannan should be the first one in there, right? He is the number one contender. Now, he fought Holloway and lost, so that kind of went away there for a while. But then last Saturday, what happened? Elia Taboria fought, destroyed Josh Emmett. And I think most people watching that were like, this guy needs to be the next guy. Like, and when you look at Yaya Rodriguez, right, it's funny because <laughs> he he hasn't earned the shot in the way other guys have, I don't think, right? He's he had a great win against Josh Emmett, but before that it was a shoulder injury against Brian Ortega, and then it was losing uh, against Max Holloway, and before that he's asked why it was 2019. So in the last four years, he's basically had one loss, one win, and one kind of no contest. That was a win, but one loss and, and two wins. It just... Now, now I'm talking down this fight before I talk it up. So, um, the reason I'm saying that is... I think we look. We're, we have the fight now, and not to you know, not to go full Dana White here or anything, but we need to almost like enjoy it because at the end of the day, even though maybe it doesn't make sense, even though maybe Aaron Lallan was was definitely fucked over, and even though I think Kilia Taboria deserves it more right now, and I think it'd actually be you know a way more winnable fight for him than it is for Yair Rodriguez. What we have though is amazing, right? And let's get on to that because. I actually think what we have here, and I've said this previously, I think directly after the last uh, Yair Rodriguez fight, possibly, was we have, in my opinion, the best fighter in the UFC in Alexander Volkanovsky. And, you know, you can say, oh, Sean, what are you talking about? He lost his last fight, but grand. If he's not one, he's 1.5, you know? He went up a weight class now, right? So that's fine. One of the top two fighters in the world. And we have, I think, maybe the most exciting fighter in the UFC, right? And and if he's not the most exciting fighter, again, top top five anyway. I don't think most I don't think most people would argue against that, right? So that's amazing. And it's not like he's just exciting. He's a very, very, very good fighter too. And that is some prospect, isn't it? Imagine like any any sport you watch, you have the best team against the most exciting team. Right now, in certain sports, maybe that would be a, a, a an absolute destruction or an easy win for one side, and maybe it will be here too. But if you get like the attacking side who are exciting going, and they get a run, my God, that's exciting. If they cause the the best team a little bit of defensive problems because they bring something a little bit different or a little bit you know over the top that others don't bring. It could cause the person who's rarely challenged a massive challenge. So that's the reason I'm excited for this. Like, I I do think, and you go back and you watch all of um, Yair Rodriguez's fights, and look, we'll, we'll be doing breakdowns and, and uh, Sherdog, and, and everyone will be doing their breakdowns before the fight. You know, it's still um, it's still a while. I, I probably should have said when it's on and all that, but it's on in UFC 290 on the 8th of July, so we don't have too long to wait for it, but... We we just have, and, and when I said that, my, my point here is like, well, we're going to be doing all breakdowns and we look at the jab and we look at the wrestling and we look at this, that and everything, right? But if you look at it simply and say, the, the what Yair Rodriguez has done in his career, if he goes out and he's able to put out what he normally puts out, could it cause trouble for Alexander Volkanovsky? And now, what I mean by that is, like, his offensive brilliance, his ability to come from behind, his ability to throw mad strikes that you don't know are coming. If he can do that against Alexander Volkanovsky, could it cause him problems? Absol- I, I, absolutely. I, I think it'd be very hard to deny that, right? Now, we can talk about the rest of the fight in a second and how maybe Volkanovsky can stop that. But if, 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 if Rodriguez can be successful... In not only like not only successful being offensive, but yeah, sorry, not only a, a successive, uh, successful with the offense, but successful being offensive. I think that's more of the question, because if you can be 
offensively successful, then your offense will have success. And what I mean by that is, right, he could have 25 minutes and not, you know, be able to throw one flying wheel kick or one punch or anything like that. So he has he didn't have any success being offensive. But if he does have the ability to throw the flying wheel kicks and his jabs and every shot, I think he will be successful. Now, you look at the other side of it and you think for Volkanovski, this is a very different test than anything he's faced before. Like, you look at the fighters he has faced in the, in the last few fights. Isla Makachev, nothing like Yaya Rodriguez, you know, a, a wrestle boxer, but in the highest wrestle boxer terms you could ever find. Max Holloway, very, you know, uh, varied and throws a lot of shots as well, but not as flashy and as different stance and everything like that. Korean Zombie did just destroyed him. Ortega, no. Holloway, two or three times more. Mendez, Aldo, Elkins, Kennedy, Shane. There's nothing there. Like, there, there's just absolutely nothing there ever like him. And there aren't many people in the world like him. So, from the other side of it, then, from Volkanovski's side, you're looking at it and you're thinking, right, this guy is the best fighter in the world, and now he's a completely different uh, style matchup to go up against. That's just fascinating, Mike. That is really fascinating. So if you're a fan of Yair Rodriguez and a fan of fun fights, you could really see a fun fight. If you're a fan of Volkanovski and he's unbelievable technical ability, and I'm a fan of both of those things, but just the latter for a second, um, Volkanovski's technical ability, how will it fare against Rodriguez? Like we saw at the weekend, um, Taboria's technical, technical ability and how it fared against the mad one-shot knockout want to, want to be power of Josh Emmett. And when I say want to be, like he wants to knock you out with one shot and he will throw that one shot all the time. Or not just one shot, but he will throw combinations and hopefully the one at the end that lands will knock you out. Look how easily he dealt with that. Like he used Josh Emmett's um, um, attacking prowess as a weapon. He, he knew it was coming and he waltzed around it and destroyed him. That's exactly what he did. Like, how will Volkanovski use Yair Rodriguez's offensive ability as a weapon against him? That's the big question for me. That really is it. Because if he can, he, it could be another destruction here. I'm like, God almighty, that would be absolutely unbelievable. If, like, if Volkanovski can do that to Rod Rodriguez and completely shut him down, I, I'm very interested. And as I said, I, I leave, like, the technical breakdown to, uh, to everyone who's technically breaking down, including myself, maybe in a couple of weeks. But... Um, I just think it's a fascinating matchup in in terms of where, f first of all, we, we kind of know what year, year will try to do, and that's be a year. But what will Volkanovski try to do? Like, will he, will he go to Frankie Edgar route and try to take him down and try to dominate him on the ground? Like, will he just say, right, okay, I'm a technical striker and your mad striking's not going to beat that, so let's just have a striker matchup and I'm going to win it. Like, is that what he's going to do? Is he going to try to get inside and, you know, take away the lint of Yair, put the pressure on him and not let him kick and not let him jab and throw all those shots from the outside uh, and beat him that way and knock him out maybe and finish him with pressure? Uh, you know, there's so many unanswered questions. Like, the, it's funny because I, I, even doing the betting show on different things, I find it a lot easier to break down the fights with lads who aren't as amazing as the likes of Volkanovski because, like, you kind of know what you're getting with them lads. With Volkanovski or Yair Rodriguez, you haven't a clue what you're getting. <laughs> you know, you could get you could get anything, and it's almost certainly uh, guaranteed to be brilliant. So, yeah, that's the first fight I'm looking forward to. Cannot wait, uh, and it should be absolutely epic. The second fight, number two I'm going for. It's actually on the same night, July 8th. Funny enough, actually, be, I, I should have done this one first because it'll be taking place before. But ma it matters not. Uh, this is on the uh, PFL European card. It's uh, in Berlin, in Germany. And it's actually a rematch between Franz Malambo and Dominic Wooding. And you're probably saying to me, Sean, you just went from the best fighter in the world in a, in a title unification bout to, you know, two lads. I don't know if they're headlining, but in, in the middle of a PFL European card. Um, and I, 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 do you know what? I'll stand by that because... These are two very, very, very good fighters. Two very good fighters. Um, when they last fought, it was it was a long time ago. At, uh, at this stage, it was back in 2019. Um, it, it, it was at Bellator 227. And 
Franz Malamba won that. You know, and he won it pretty well. It was at that fight. Very, very good win. Very good performance. Um, he went down to fight Ricky Bandez after that. Ended up losing that fight, which, you know, could have got him a long way. Oh, look, if the, that was around the time I think the rankings came out, I think he would have been ranked. I think he might have been ranked, actually. But he got a win after that. Anyway, he lost Ricky Bandez. Bellator let him go as they did with a lot of people around then, but since then he's been on an absolutely great run. Um, you know, won the uh, the tournament over in Combatches Global, won three fights in one night, uh, and won an FEN fight as well before that. So he's on a what a, a five fight win streak now. Um, won eight of his last nine, an unbelievable run for for Franz Malambo in the last uh, uh, in the last what five years or so. But he hasn't fought since twenty twenty one, and it's been a real tough time. You know. He thought he might be able to get into to tough or the, into the UFC on that great win streak. You know, PFL, he didn't know if he was going to get into a tournament or if he was going to be on this or when he was going to... Like, it's just such a long time out for Franz Malambo. And if you don't know Franz, he's a, like... He's a very, 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 very good fighter. You know, he's a finisher at, uh, at you know down at bantamweight, eight wins, eight finishes, and in thirteen wins. You know, his record of of thirteen and five. You know, it's you might say okay, thirteen and five, but as I said, he's won eight of his last nine. He he went out and he fought and brave, and you know, we've I've spoken about brave before. I think sometimes it's a little bit of a mistake sending fighters out there when they're young in their career. Like, they put him in against Stephen Lawman twice, and if anyone knows anything about that sort of place, you know how good Steve Lawman is. You know, he fought Aiden James and Brave as well, you know, which was, you know, fair enough matchmaking, I suppose, but I, I'm not sure the, the Steve Lawman fight was, especially when he's four fights into his career. But anyway, um, he fought all comers, and he... You know, records are for DJs, and then the record improved and improved and improved and improved, and uh, so you know, so much so that uh, I think uh, I think Combatia Global were a little bit afraid that he might beat their champion and <laughs> everything like that. So we're like, okay, friends, we'll we gotta let you go. But anyway, Dominic Wooding on the other side of it, then he's been on an unbelievable run as well. Um, since that, now he he lost the friends and he lost one more fight to Bellator, and then he was out of Bellator, but he went over. And he became the champion in uh, in Cage Warriors. Won three fights in a row. Beat Nathan Fletcher, who's one of the top prospects, uh, in the middle of two other wins. But then lost to Mar- uh, Michele Martignoni. Now <clears throat> there was a bit of a contract dispute with Cage Warriors, and it was played out um, very publicly. I think I I think I spoke to. Um, uh, on on my interview I did here in Sherdog with uh, with Graham Bylan about that. Maybe, maybe I didn't, but I I was I, I think I did actually. Yeah, uh, but. Look, he lost the title fight that parted ways, and now he is here uh, at Bellator Europe. And like, if you look at Bellator Europe's um, roster, this is the fight between probably two of the five best fighters in it. I would argue that Franz Malambo is the best fighter uh, in it. You also have Dakota Dechev and Simeon Powell and a few more as well. But I, I don't think many people would argue that these two are two of the top five fighters in the whole roster. And to have the two of them fighting is the reason I've put this there. The, the first fight was very good, and I think both of them have improved an awful lot. I'm so interested to see how Franz Malambo um, looks after so long out. You know, it's one of those ones where he has so much talent. He has improved the whole time throughout his career. And... I just hope that couple of years out of the cage hasn't and won't be an issue for him. Because, like, you look at Carl Moore when he came back, that was everyone talking about him as well. It was like, well, is it going to be an issue? And it wasn't. You know, he's done unbelievably since, in my opinion, he should be the number one contender light heavyweight in Bellator now. So, you know, the SBG camp are used to getting people prepared after a good while out. Um, and you would hope that they will have France prepared as well. But, you know, you're Dominic Wooding and you kind of betting yourself in cage warriors. Uh, trying to get out of your contract, you didn't manage it. You had one last title shot, you lost it, and now you're fighting another guy you lost to. And this is a massive fight. Like Dominic Wooding was there, there was talks of him going to the UFC and all of that. And you know, from my my belief was he was on the verge of the UFC, but he wanted to go the PFL route instead. Now, will there be a, you know will there be a 135 pound PFL tournament next year? Will the winner ever get into that? There could be a million quid up for the line for the winner of this fight itself. Like, I do think the winner of this will win the tournament. It's a massive fight. It's a massive fight. It's a fun fight. Two strikers. I haven't even talked about the fight itself. And I will do more of that, obviously. I'll, I'll have a preview coming out for this. But a fantastic fight. Trust me on this one. And it's one you're going to want to be uh, tuning in for. Right. The next fight is uh, in the middle of the month. So 
I have two fights from the 8th of July. I have two fights from July 29th. So there's three weeks between them, but I have one in the middle, and it's July 14th. And it's, uh, it's a very, very interesting one. The one championship card over in Singapore on July 14th. Gary Tonin versus Shamil Gassanov. Um, you know, people probably know Gary Tonin <laughs> by now. I would say he is the uh, the jiu-jitsu wizard, um, the, the lion killer. So many uh, submission finishes, but looked good as a striker <clears throat> in his career so far. He's had, obviously, all his fights in one championship and is uh, 7-1. Now, that one loss was to Tan Lee, who is exceptional. Anyone who watches or listens to my um, my previews and my breakdowns for these one championship cards knows how good Tan Lee is and know how much I think of him as a fighter. He's very, very, very good. Uh, so there's no shame in that, you know, but he'll, he'll have to be watching out in this fight because Shamil uh, Gasanov is absolutely no joke either. Now, he's a ground fighter. Seven submission wins in nine fights. The other two have won by the, he's won by decision. Um, you know, he's last what three in a row, all submissions. One decision before that, then two more submissions after that as well. So, as I said, seven of nine, but also what five of the last six, lots, lots of submission wins, lots of groundwork. And he's you know, one fight only in PFL so far, but having watched him for that fight. And seeing a couple of his fights in, in where's he fought in FNG and, and other places like that, uh, this guy is is an absolute beast. And he, he's not just a ground fighter, he can fight on the feet as well. I think this is actually a very interesting fight because, oh, like, what's, what's going to happen here? <laughs> what's going to happen? Are, is this going to be a fight on the feet between two good you know, good, good fighters on the feet, but who are known for their ground games, are are we going to have the, I suppose, the wrestler versus the jujitsu uh, jiu player on the ground? I don't know. Like, you look at Gatsunov, and you would be very wary to ever pick against a guy like that nine fights into his career. But, you yeah, know, Tonin, usually when jujitsu guys come over, they're like, oh, well, you know, I learned a bit of striking, I flopped to my back, uh, I'll try to take someone's leg or get on top or you know we've seen that right countless times, but he is very different. He is very different. You know his striking looked absolutely amazing before that Tan Lee fight, and even in that fight, it was the jujitsu that lasted for him, not the striking, um, because he got ground and pounded out. I just like you look at also at Tan or at um at Tonin and. The timeout is very interesting because he had, and you know, I, I, I tend to mention, we tend to not mention this, but we should. Like he had two years out, well, maybe not two years, but an, a year and a half out before the Tan Lee fight. He had nearly a year out before the Jonathan Nunes fight. And he bounced back with a win there in uh, in January. And now he's had another, what, six months. Like, I don't know, is that necessarily good? Is it, is it good? Or have you learned a lot of stuff or have you been injured or what? It's uh, I always I always struggle I always struggle with those now with Tonin though my thoughts would be improvement because he's a guy who's always shown improvement and if he can improve and he has improved it could be a big big a big big scalpier if he can win this and we're talking about title shots after as well and I must say like you know uh, Gasanov has a, a bit of time out as well he's a, he's a guy who hasn't had the most fights in the world he two fights in 2022 one in 2021 a couple in 2020 a couple in 2019 it was a three year break between 2016 and 2015 so not exactly the most active either so maybe that's even even score there but I think if Tonin can win this it's going to be massive it's not just massive for him but it's massive for one championship as well so that's definitely one for me to uh, to keep an eye on right the last couple of fights July 29th the first one I'm going to go to is the one on the Bellator versus Risen card and people might be thinking well there's a few fights in this which one you're going to go for this is this is my list of my favourite fights of, of the month Danny Sabatello versus Magomed Magomedov I, I love this fight I absolutely love this fight now I think this is massive because, look, when this tournament started, or well, the tournament's over now, but when did the tournament started, I really thought that Magomed Magomedov was going to be the guy. And once the tournament started, I think a lot of people thought Danny Sabatella was going to be the guy, right? So the tournament's over. The, the winner of that tournament's going to be fighting the champion coming up soon, hopefully after his wonderful win uh, a couple of weeks ago. And 
someone is going to have to put themselves in the mix to be the next guy. No pun intended. So the winner of this really, like, if you think about it, right, the, uh, look, Magomed, Magomed off his last two of his last three. Um, Danny Sabatello lost, he won his last fight, won the, lost the fight before that. But the winner of this could be the next contender or could be, you know, one fight away from it just because of the tournament, just because of the way everything has kind of landed. So this is an absolutely massive fight as well as it being a very interesting fight because you look at their two styles and these guys are two wrestlers. They're two wrestlers. Now, both guys, and funnily enough, both guys lost to Rafian Stotts. And more so for Magomed Magomedov, funnily enough, wrestling was a big part of it. Now, the Sabatello fight was obviously, you know, a, a weird one, a funny kind of fight. But Rafian Stotts out-wrestled Magomed Magomedov. Um, he, you know, he took the fight away from him by doing that. And if... Sabatello can do that. I think he will win the fight as well. Now, he might have... To, the difference between Stotts maybe and Sabatello is maybe Stotts can strike with him and beat him, whereas I think Sabatello will have to wrestle with him, beat him, and then offensively wrestle with him and beat him, right? So he'll have to win, obviously, the defensive wrestling realm, but the offensive wrestling realm as well. So I think it's <laughs> I think it's an even tougher one. And a fight that happened recently in Bellator, Phil Davis versus um, Corey Anderson, a fight I, I wasn't expecting to really enjoy. I did really enjoy it. And I think this might be a similar sort of thing. I think the takedown attempts, the reversals, hitting switches and all of that, and this is going to be epic. And I just love that sort of fight. I love that sort of fight. I think it's going to be a real battle. And uh, I can't wait for this. I think this should be five rounds. Bellator, if you're out there, someone send this video to Danny Sabatello because I bet you he'd be up for the five rounds. And I'd say, Magomed, Magomed, I wouldn't say no either. So let's get make this one five rounds. I'd love it. I'd love it. I think this will be a fun fight. Right. Uh, the final fight from the UFC card on uh, July 29th at UFC 291 in Salt Lake City. Why do UFC bring in so many... A bit of use to Salt Lake City. What's in Salt Lake City? It must be giving them, it must be giving them plenty of kind to go there, I think. But the the BMF title is on the line again, lads. Oh, the, the one we're all been waiting for. Um, but what a fight! Justin Gaethje against Dustin Poirier. And look, I have a terrible memory, right? Even great fights, I forget them. Um, and the Poirier versus Gaethje one. Uh, at what was it UFC on Fox 29 back in 2018 uh, is one that's kind of hard to forget <laughs> you know and do you know what I might go back and actually like do a rewatch and, and watch it uh, at some stage over the last while but there was a point there when when Justin Gaethje got into the UFC and that was what his third fight in the UFC if I'm not mistaken it was it, it, was, it was like when uh, Chandler came in as well. It was just epic after epic after epic. You know, knocking out Michael Johnson after he said, and I eat pieces of shit like you for breakfast or whatever it was. And then, you know, the big James Vick knockout, but the the, the classics against Eddie and, and Pari as well. And the Cerrone fight. Just absolutely unbelievable. And I think that the, the that point in Pari's career as well was oh, something a little bit different, right? Because... But prior to that, it was like it, it, he still wasn't the, the the really really great fighter we know him as today, right? After the McGregor fight, he fought Ferreira, Medeiros, Joseph Duffy, Bobby Green. It's good fighters, beat them all. Then lost to Michael Johnson. Then he was fighting Jim Miller, who you know, with all due respect, Jim Miller's a very good fighter, but he's not, you know, he's not the upper echelon of lightweight. And that was 2017, you know. So it hasn't been all that very long. He had the no contest against Eddie Alvarez. Then he fought Anthony Pettis, won that. And that you know, that was around the start of it. And the next fight was Gaethje. And that was a massive part of it as well. In the fourth round, knocking him out. You know, and I think the biggest part of that was, right, and I think my analysis coming into that fight as well was, you know, is Poirier um, the, 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 the best guy when it's put on him? Like, is he going to be able to last? Is, is he going to be able to take the power, the durability? That's the word. Does he have the durability to go with Gaethje? And that fight changed Poirier's career. I firmly believe that. When the history books are written on Dustin Poirier's career, I think that was the fight that changed because people started looking at him differently. He goes in, he destroys Eddie Alvarez, he beats Max Holloway, another one where people start looking at him differently. And you know, okay, he's had the Habib fight, the two massive McGregor fights, but things changed for him after that. And now it feels again like this could be a number one contender fight. 
you know, are very close to it. We'll see what happens with, with obviously Charles and, and, and the champ and all of that. But I just foresee another epic here. And even though both these guys, uh, Gaethje, I suppose especially, has become more technical over the years, I still think it's going to be impossible for the two of these guys not to have an epic. It really is. And, and I I cannot wait for it. You can forget about the BMF. I don't need that shite. I don't think anyone listening to this video probably needs it. You know, we might agree or disagree on whether you should have it or not. Grand. But what we all probably agree on is this fight is going to be brilliant. And I cannot wait for it. So, yeah. Those are my five fights for the month. Um, I'll quickly go over them again. July 8th, UFC 290 Volkanovski versus Rodriguez. July 8th is, again, PFL 4, Franz Malamba versus Dominique Wooding. Uh, the 14th over at one championship Gary Tonin versus Shamil Gassanov the 29th again two fights Sandy Sabatello versus Magomed Magomedov over in Bellator and then Justin Gaethje versus Dustin Poirier UFC 291 those are my five fights to look out for in the month of July thanks everybody for listening my name is Sean Sheehan for SureDog.com and I'll see you all next time